Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to, re to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, that is the unchangeableness, that it does not change, the immutability of his counsel, his advice, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, may God bless to us this uh, important portion of scriptures that has created a great deal of difficulty with uh, uh, men of God and certainly believers everywhere as they have read it. The, the message, like the entire epistle that we have before us, is a message to Hebrew Christians. We wouldn't normally say that. We don't say uh, we don't say four old Christians, but the Hebrews, of course, were the recipients of God's program and his choice, his sovereign choice as a nation, um, to receive all that was involved in what we call today Judaism. And we know from the Old Testament the detailed history of that. Well, there is a difficulty because... When we look at this epistle, we've got to keep that in mind and keep in mind exactly how much of a problem uh, that would be for them. You know, a Gentile today, uh, and I'm one, a Gentile today, we are, as Ephesians says, we're without hope. We have no covenant, and we're out hope, without hope and without God in this world. And under those circumstances, it pleases God to bring to us the essence of the gospel from the New Testament, after the gospels and the Acts and the book of Romans and so forth, and that's brought to us that we might be saved. And so that if we trust in the Lord Jesus, as the company here tonight is, uh, is insofar as I know, uh, and entirely, and uh, then the first thing that happens is we learn the New Testament. We learn the New Testament because there was the gospel that we got saved by. We begin to learn the New Testament, and then we discover the beauties of the Old Testament 
that give us shadows of the things that come about in the New Testament and especially concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're speaking of details that are very wonderful and graphic details. But you've got to remember that these details of the Old Testament, when we think about a Jew, a Hebrew, in the same circumstances as us coming to hear the gospel, even though they were, in, they were engulfed in Judaism, this religion, and they hear the gospel and they're saved. Now, the first thing that they realize is it dawns upon them, and it's taught by uh, people that other people that are Christians, some maybe Hebrew Christians, maybe just Gentile Christians. And they're taught the, how the Old Testament fulfills what the Lord Jesus Christ has given us when we have trusted in him. So they probably begin looking at how the Old Testament is fulfilled, and then they realize in the New Testament how this shadow of the things of the Lord Jesus becomes substance in the New Testament, and he fulfills all of these types and shadows. That gives you a setting to the problem here that this writer had. So in connection with him telling this to the Hebrew Christians and explaining to them for this enormously important and difficult transition to make from having a high, having a, a priest, a high priest, having a religion, having the details of the, ta uh, the temple, from days beyond that, before that, the tabernacle, all these things, and suddenly there is a new thing, and someone's telling you the high priest of the temple is not needed. We have a great high priest who's now passed into the heavens. It's Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And that's a lot for the Jew to take in when he becomes a believer. So that's what makes this portion difficult to understand because we've got to put ourselves in that place. We mentioned that there's five great warnings in the book of Hebrews, and they're in chapter 2 and 3. And then they're here in chapter 5 and 6 is the third warning. And then there's two more in chapter 10 and 12. Well, this one began with what we did in, in chapter 5, because the apostle or the, uh, the writer here is telling them that they have a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And I'm sure, even though it's in the 110th Psalm, I'm sure that, that never dawned on them at all. When they were just Jews... Before they were saved, they just thought of the, of the high priest as the Lion of Aaron. But now they've got something new to think about because this high priest doesn't just fulfill the work that Aaron typified in his, in his ministry. And he fulfills that, that is the Lord Jesus, through his death because he didn't give sacrifices like the Old Testament priests. He gave himself. He offered himself without spot unto God, and that was his sacrifice. But then there's more. This man, Melchizedek, tells us that that priesthood isn't all that he makes up, all that he fills up. He also is a high priest from heaven, he having passed into the heavens. And that's not after the order of, of Aaron as a pattern for his work of giving himself as the high priest. It's after the order of this man, Melchizedek, it's eternal, and Melchizedek spoke of that, as I discussed a little uh, on Sunday. And so now this third warning uh, is very extensive. It begin, began with chapter 5, telling them that they must mature in the things of God. They must go on from the ABCs. They first learned certain principles, and those principles were found in the Old Testament. And as believers, they were told, probably quite wonderfully by somebody, and shared in the Old Testament how the Lord Jesus has fulfilled those things. So the things that we see as this chapter opens, and the things that are drawn to our attention, begins by the, their need, in this warning, their need to leave these principles, principles of the doctrine of Christ. They were principles that were not found in an extensive foundational look at the New Testament, they were principles that came to them by showing how the Lord Jesus fulfilled things in the Old Testament. So these principles that you see in at the end of chapter of the end of verse one and verse two, 
these, uh, these foundations as repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms or ablutions, washings, the laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These things are all, they need to go on from these things. They're holding them up. And there are many greater things about the, these things that the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ will bring to them as they advance. So they must advance, and that's part of the warning right up to this point. But then he says, when he wants them to advance, he says, however, he says, this will we do if God permit. Now he wants them to mature in advance. They are believers. They, so as believers, they should be able to mature in advance. Now I just want to jump ahead, something we've already read though. Just jump ahead for a moment and put your eye down, as my... My beloved brother now with the Lord, Jack Hunter, used to say, drop your eye down and look to verse 9, but beloved. He calls them a name that usually you call Christians if you're a Christian, especially if you're teaching them, beloved. Lovely to call the people of God beloved. He says, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though thus we speak. Still speaking to believers. But you see, in between these two points of uh, stones of, of testimony, the one is, if God permit, I want you to go on. I want you to go on to maturity. I want you to lay aside and put behind you these foundation stones that you tried to find in the Old Testament, and they were wonderful as fine, but we've got to go on from there. And he says, but... Because I'm persuaded that you will go on. I'm persuaded you're going to show all the things that accompany salvation. And then he says in verse 9, though thus we speak. Now that thus we speak is the problem part of this chapter in Hebrews. In thus we speak, we get what comes after the first three verses that we've looked at. He says there, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. And now he mentions certain things about these he's now going to speak about, who I'm going to tell you flat out. They are not believers. So he's speaking to believers. Why does he turn to some people that are not believers? Because this people were being tempted on all sides as Hebrew Christians. They were being tempted to say, under the persecutions that they were enduring, and they're great. You see at the end of this book how they prove they were Christians. They endured these hardships and persecutions. They were because the Jewish nation didn't like them, because they had become Christians. And the world around them didn't like them because they were once Jews and now they call themselves Christians. There was persecution great. And some of them thought, well, maybe we could relieve a little of this if we just drop back a little bit. Let's just drop back to our old ways in Judaism. And you know, when things cool down, We'll go back to the Lord Jesus Christ and everything we knew about him. Now, he wants them to know that whereas I said at the end of chapter 5, what were their options? Well, he wanted them to go on unto maturity. But what were their options? They could go on unto maturity in the things of God, go beyond these fundamentals that had come out of the Old Testament, begin to learn the New Testament the way it was to be given, or at least the ministry of the New Testament, such as they had it then, the truth of the Lord Jesus as the substance and not the shadow. So they could go on was one option and mature, and that would be the best option. Or they could just let things go the way they were and not learn and mature. Now, they'd still be believers if they did that, those that were acknowledged here as believers. But they would face certain things under the, under the classification of God doing his work of working in a believer's life who does not go on. That's chastisement, chastening. That sometimes can be judgment. It doesn't mean they're lost. It means that God is trying to get to them so they'll move on. Those were their two options. But now you see they're trying to think about dropping back to Judaism. Dropping back to Judaism until things cooled down and then going back and will renew. But the writer is obliged, therefore, to say, 
This we will do, go on to maturity, if God permit, because he knows the possibility that some of them might be thinking about this, because he's probably seen others already do it. And he wants to tell them the truth about trying to do that. Is that an option for a believer? And the answer is emphatically no. A believer cannot abandon the things and go back to something like Judaism, because under Judaism, you're talking about the people as a nation who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, who rejected him as the Messiah. You cannot go back under that. It, that's impossible. And if you do go back under that, thinking, if you do go back under that, it will show you're not a believer because it will be impossible to bring you back to the point of repentance and faith again in the Lord Jesus. It cannot be done. When you go back, you will be going back to the nation that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, that said to the nation, your house is left unto you desolate, that told them that attributed to the Lord Jesus, the uh, attribute to the Lord Jesus certain associations with demonic powers. And he said to them that they had committed an unpardonable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. They would be going back to that group. Can that group be saved? Not at all. They're under judgment. The nation lost their, uh, lost their ability to receive the kingdom at the hands of their Messiah when they rejected the Lord Jesus. And that's what they would be going back on. So now their options, if they want to do that, if they want to take as an option going back, it's impossible for them ever to be renewed unto repentance to be saved again, if you will. They couldn't, weren't saved the first time if they go back. They were professors. But if they go back, they will not have the opportunity to come into this again. Now, the problem is unique to those who worshipped in the temple and those who were Jews, this problem of going back into Judaism. But it's not unlike professors today in the Lord Jesus Christ who then forsake their, their profession. They come this close, perhaps, to trusting, and then they say, I'll do it another day. So much so that Dwight L. Moody... Dwight L. Moody spoke on a number of occasions about one particular case that he had in the gospel. Excuse me. And that was the case of a man, and we have probably all heard of similar cases. And Dwight L. Moody preached the gospel to this man on several occasions, and he kept deferring, deferring. And the final time that Dwight L. Moody spoke to this man, he came to his bedside and he was sick, and he was on his deathbed. And Dwight L. Moody again preached the gospel to him. He says, oh, if you could just believe. And the man said to him, no. He said, I've had my chance. And he never got saved. But he said, I've had my chance. Now that's like these believers, unbel or these unbelievers, that the writer finds it necessary to include in this warning. Including this warning, because the options, if you take that route of going back into Judaism, it shows you're not saved, and your options are limited, that's it. You can go back, and then you're under judgment. The judgment of God, not just the chastening of God if you fail to mature in the word. The judgment of God, outside of God, which is the great white throne judgment. So it's a serious thing that he brings them to here. And under this persecution, you can sympathize with them, certainly. In chapters 4, 5, and 6, he notes certain things that were true of those who might go back to Judaism, having come so far towards repentance. Now, a lot of times we read these things, and they sound very much like things that would be peculiar to a believer. And he says this, he says, for, when he states this impossibility, that this, there's no option with this going back under Judaism, falling away, that is. He says, they were once enlightened, and they tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good, the word, good word of God, and the powers of the world to come. And it says, if they f fall away, that is if they go back to Judaism, it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. That is, to bring them to that point of repentance and the faith that saves if they do that. Now, those five things are very similar to what we have 
when, believer, when men and women come to the Lord Jesus Christ. They all have something meritorious to link with a person who gets saved. But the fact of the matter is, they really aren't. One of the, uh, a couple of the most troubling things is, tasting of certain things here, he says, tasting of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. And the argument is made that the Lord Jesus tasted death for every man, for all things. He tasted death for all things. And so they say, if you say that tasting these things is just sorting having a glimpse of them and not real Christianity, what does that say about the Lord Jesus tasting death? Well, the way the word's used, it's merely a matter of experiencing it. And you can experience the word of God, and the reason you can experience the word of God is covered under one thing, and that is they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. That is, they got shared by the Spirit of God with what God needed to save them. Now, that's true today. The Spirit of God in the world will convince men of sin because they believe not on me, the Lord Jesus said. Of righteousness. What righteousness? The righteousness of God. The righteousness which his righteousness requires me to require. And judgment. And that's not the great white throne judgment. That's the judgment whereby Satan was overcome. That's the judgment by which Satan was finished. It's the judgment of the cross when the Lord Jesus was judged for our sins. That's the greatest judgment. There's no judgment to compare with the judgment of the cross. And you know, we come to repentance in this chapter, and people sometimes wonder about that. They say, well, what does it really mean? It means to change your mind. And uh, a lot of people argue about uh, over repentance. Is it part of the gospel today? Well, let me tell you emphatically, it is. It is part, but it's not presented exactly in the way it was in the book of Acts, when it was a transition for a nation that was headed one way, Israel, and needed to make an about face, a great change of mind, the other way. Today, uh, people that, uh, well, I'll tell you a little story. Two, uh, two men, both who are, are involved in preaching, and, and they went to preach in two, two different places. Two men that I esteem very highly. They wouldn't mind me telling this story. And they went to different places far from each other, and they preached. And they preached the gospel. And the one man was criticized. He was criticized because he didn't bring into his gospel message the word repentance and the need of repentance specifically. So he was criticized. The other man at an assembly, far from that, he preached and he mentioned repentance and the need of repentance in his gospel message. And they criticized him because said, we don't believe that repentance applies today. Now, of those two assemblies, who was right? Neither one. And I say that you will understand repentance in the gospel today if you know why John, in the gospel of John, never mentions repentance. Paul in Hebrew, and Paul in, in Romans mentions it twice. Once he says something that's absolutely wonderful about repentance, and that is the goodness of God is what leads men to repentance, to change their mind, to turn toward the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. So he doesn't really specifically make it a part of the salvation. He says it's the goodness of God that leads us to it. And the other place, he says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So that just means God doesn't change his mind about gifting a man or a woman in a certain way or calling them in a certain way. So you see, repentance as a word is not prominent. But as a thing, it's there because when we are convinced of sin, believing not on him as sinners, righteousness, the righteousness of God, and judgment, his judgment for us on the cross, when we're to get be convinced of those three things as a sinner, you cannot help but change your mind. So the repentance is right there. That's why John doesn't need to mention it specifically as a word, because the precept is built into the gospel in the gospel of John. Now, I digressed a little on that because I thought it was important. So, in these chapters, these things do not necessarily make up salvation. They make up the Spirit of God, who you see, by that power vested in him, if you will, of convincing men of sin, righteousness, and judgment, the Spirit of God can go to the hearts of men as he pleases to seek to bring them to the Lord Jesus. The natural man receives not the spirit of, not the things of God. They're foolishness unto him. 
But God, by his spirit, can open things to the natural man that they may be saved. And that's what you had here when these men or women were brought to the point of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus, but stopped short of that. And they cannot be renewed to that point. They will not be renewed. It's not really God's fault. They will not be renewed to that point. And so um, he goes on to say about the earth drinking in the rain and the little picture there of, you know, things come forth when, they, when you plant them. Plants come forth and they either bring forth what you intended, the fruit of the earth, or they bring forth thorns and thistles. And that's just an illustration of what the, really it's the parable of the sower from the Lord Jesus in a different format. It just tells you that God's gospel is going out and God's gospel was there to the Hebrews in a different shape because they had a religion called Judaism. And when they wouldn't leave that, they couldn't become believers in the Lord Jesus. And when they did leave that, they had to be warned to move on. And that's part of this great warning. So we get to come to really a, quite a, a wonderful, encouraging part of this chapter when we come to verse 9. And I, as I said before, so now you will see why. Why he says in verse 9, having said, this we will do if God permit. You see, God couldn't permit them to go on into maturity if they actually weren't believers. And that's why that is put in there. It's a little, it's a little warning for us to see that there's something a little out of the ordinary that he's going to have to tell them. And that was the warning that we just discussed in verses 4 to 6. But in verse 9, he says, though we thus speak... In other words, I spoke to you that way, but I'm persuaded that you'll go on. I'm persuaded that there'll be better things, the things of salvation that accompany salvation, and they'll come out in your lives. And I'm persuaded of that because I thought you were believers all along, and I've seen the things that you've done, things that accompany salvation. He says, God is not unrighteous. He's not going to forget the things you've done, the things that have proven that you were believers, in fact. And these things, he says, uh, the labor of love showed in his name in verse 10. And he desired that everyone would show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. He wants them to go on right to the end by maturing in the things that he wants to teach them and that will be taught very deeply in the next chapters. You know, we think we've had a lot of teaching in Hebrews when we get to, to the uh, to the end of chapter 6, we think we've had a lot of teaching on the Lord Jesus as the high priest. And you know, the best is yet to come. When he begins to take up Melchizedek again in chapter 7 and move into those last chapters, 7, 8, 9, and 10, it's enormous, the, the teaching that they have to go on in maturity. And this, this writer believes that they will do so. He's persuaded that they will do so. And so it's very encouraging what he says to them in verses 9 to 12. A great encouragement. That needs to be uh, appropriate. Um, when, I, when I said that, that it was impossible, and this, he tells them certain things are impossible, we're talking about the Spirit of God's work that brought them to a certain point. And it's impossible once they've had that from the Spirit of God to that point to come back to it again if they forsake it and go back into Judaism. So he wanted to make that very clear. You see, the Spirit of God has this prerogative from God. It's one that surprises us if we think about it. The Spirit of God, in a sense, was overseeing the things of the Lord Jesus. That's why in Matthew's Gospel, uh, the, the writer speaks about John the Baptist seeing the Spirit of God descend upon the Lord Jesus like a dove. Why was the Spirit of God descending upon him? He descended upon him because the Spirit the third person of the Trinity was going to be involved as the first person, the Father, was involved in sending the Son into the world that he might depend on the Father in everything he took when he became a man. This is mentioned in these, this epistle as him learning obedience by the things that he suffered. But the Spirit of God was always there, not to correct the Lord Jesus, not to make sure that he who, in whom there is no sin, who did no sin, and who knew no sin, committed a sin, it's impossible for that. He wasn't there to see that he made the right moves. He was there so that he could justify all the moves that he did make before men as the Spirit of God. And so, in, for example, when Paul's talking about 
the Lord Jesus and, and how he's, uh, he's declared to be the Son of God by the Spirit of holiness. That's the Holy Spirit through his resurrection from the dead. That was the work of the Spirit to do that. Now, the Lord Jesus did everything he needed to be declared, uh, to declared the, the Son of God. But the Spirit of God did that in resurrection power to declare him that Son of God. It didn't adjust in any way the character of the Lord Jesus, holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Again, in Hebrews itself, it says, he offered himself without spot unto, or through the eternal spirit, he offered himself without spot unto God, you see. And so that, through the eternal spirit, what was that? Even in his death, the Lord Jesus was doing it through the eternal spirit. Perfect picture, you know, from the Old Testament of the two little birds, the two little birds that were taken, one was slain and its blood was sprinkled on the other bird and then it flew away. There you have the water that's poured over that bird as a picture of the Holy Spirit. You have the Lord Jesus in his two wonderful roles, the bird that was killed shedding the blood and then the bird that flew away touched by the blood, a picture of his resurrection, death and resurrection. But who's overseeing it all? The Holy Spirit of God. Just so that it's justified before any man that would ever raise a question about it. And so we have that very often, and we'll see it, you'll see it later in the chapters. And so we come to verse 13. I'm going to try, try to wrap up here. We come to verse, thir verse 13, and there's something wonderful when he goes back to, uh, he goes back to, the, to Abraham. Now, this is interesting because I said in chapter, in chapter 5, he was mentioning a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and if you go back to Melchizedek, you'll see what it did to the life of the patriarch Abraham when he had that great victory. And Melchizedek was there when he came back from that victory of overcoming the kings, Keterleomer and his partners, to rescue Lot, his, uh, his nephew. And there was Melchizedek with bread and wine, emblems of the very things that the twofold uh, double portion of our Lord Jesus Christ would be represented by. On the one hand, at the last Passover, it, there, was, there was bread and there was a cup of wine. But that last Passover was also the first Lord's Supper. So it was giving to us a picture of the Lord Jesus and his twofold, the twofold nature of the double portion that was his by virtue of him being the great, uh, the great um, prophet, the firstborn, the firstborn. And, and so he goes back again to Abraham here after having mentioned once more a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek or suggested it again. He's going to end with Abraham in this chapter. Now notice he never began this book in the opening uh, five chapters by saying the Lord Jesus was greater than Abraham. But in fact, he's going to tell us of his superiority to Abraham, but later. That's because he wanted to tell them things about Abraham that would get their attention without them thinking that he had anything bad to say about Abraham when he would, if he compared the Lord Jesus to Abraham. He will do it later, but only after he's told us this about Abraham. And that is, he says, when God came to Abraham and he made promise to him, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Two things, blessing and multiplication. Now, it's kind of interesting to me that this statement that he makes here concerning Abraham, and, and that he, he says to him, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I'll multiply thee, is like a, it's a kind of a, it's kind of a word picture. It's kind of a language usage that only occurs here, and you gotta go back to the first time it occurred to go to Adam. And when it came to Adam, and he, he used this to Adam, he was, telling, he was telling Adam, and he was telling the, 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 first, uh, the first man and first woman, he was telling them that they weren't to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, in the day that you eat thereof, you'll die. In fact, what he said was, in the day that you eat thereof, dying you will die. In other words, you'll die spiritually, and then you'll die physically. And they did both. Death. And... Adam was the head. Adam was the head of creation. He was the head of men. And he plunged that whole, that whole headship of Adam, plunged everyone following him into sin. And so it was an awful thing. 
Well, here in this blessing to Abraham, the same structure is used, except he's not a, it's not a curse, such as Adam received for his sin. It's a blessing. Blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Blessing and multiplication. And Abraham, similarly, is a head of humanity. He's the head that's going to bring us to Isaac. And in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And that seed, blessed seed, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And his priesthood will be built around that. And all that he calls will be built around that. When Abraham sees that part of his promise from Genesis fulfilled. This, of course, is quoted from Genesis 22. He doesn't go back to the promise of Genesis 12 to Abraham, repeated in, in uh, repeated several places, and also repeated to Isaac and to Jacob. He doesn't go back to those. He just goes to this one place. I wonder why. Blessing and multiplication. Now, you know, an interesting thing, it says it's by a promise, given by promise, and sworn by an oath. When the Amplified New Bible came out, they tried to help us in this passage by saying to us, writing up, that this, this oath and this promise, they put in brackets after that, or rather when they said, by two immutable things, two things that don't change, by two unchangeable things, and then they put in brackets the, the, the oath and the promise, end of bracket. Now, that wasn't translating the scriptures when the Amplified Bible did that. That was interpreting the scriptures. And I'm sorry to say it was picked up by every, almost every English translation since then. Many of them, at least. But is that what God is telling us here? Because it says, by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Now, it was wonderful that God, that God swore by himself on the base, same basis as he had promised. But I think God swore on the, that the promise was as true as it was when he gave it because he was raising Abram's expectations that he, that he needed to see from Abraham. He was going, Abraham was going to be called upon to take Isaac up the mountain and offer him there. Now, you know, Abraham believed those promises when he first got them, I'm sure. Oh, they stammered, they stuttered a little bit, and they, and they stumbled a little bit over Isaac. There was laughter over the thought of having this miraculous son, Isaac. But he held on to it. And then he got the son, Isaac, by promise. And when he comes to the Mount Moriah, he's asked to offer him up. I think what you have here is God raising the ante, if I may use that term. He swore on the blessing and multiplication he had placed into the covenant given to Abraham. It's not the whole covenant. It's just two things, blessing and multiplication. And those two things. And I think that he, the way he words it, he wants us to be able to look at this and say, see something that tells us God could not have lied. Now God adding his, with all due respect, God adding his, his oath on top of his promise, to most people just leaves it quite in the same place. All right, God said it, and he made an oath of it. But if you're saying he cannot lie, surely you must be giving me something here to prove it one way or the other. And I think exactly that is true. This grows out of the oath and promise. But the two things evidently that he can, that, it, that proves that it's impossible for God to lie are the blessing and the multiplication. That blessing and multiplication was a blessing and multiplication in the Lord Jesus Christ as the great high priest. If you came believing him, you would be blessed with salvation. And multiplication is that there's no limitation on the number of people that can come to him and get that blessing. So if I find one person who has been blessed by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I can't see all your pictures right now, but if I could... I could look and see, oh, he blessed there. There's a person who's saved. I know they're saved. Oh, I know they're saved. I know. So when I see one, I have proved that God is the one who swore and God who could not lie and gave me something tangible that I could look at to prove that God did not lie. There's a blessing, the blessing of salvation. And when I see two, I've proved multiplication. And there's more than two, many more. And so he raises this to higher level.
for Abraham because Abraham's going to be called to a higher level. And Abraham, who was separated from Ur of the Chaldees, understood why. And Abraham was not just separated from Ur of the Chaldees, but he was separated from his father. His father came as far as Haran. He had to move on without his father. He was separated from Lot, who kept coming with him, because that was better. But you know, they were all things that were not distinctly spiritual. When he got this miraculous son that would be picture of the calling of all men and women to blessing who are in the church and the calling back to God of all of Israel in a coming day. And when he got that son, he had reached the pinnacle. What did God need of him in his separating him? Because now he was going to not separate him from something that was carnal, like his father, like Ur of the Chaldees, like his nephew Lot, like Sodom and Gomorrah. He was going to separate him, from, separate him from something distinctly spiritual. What does God require of us? Just everything. Just everything. That's what this priesthood is all about. He just wants us to give if we can and we can't as much as he gave. But we have what he gave so that we might give what he wants, what he wants. And so what a wonder this is, that we have these things from our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the two immutable things I maintain are the blessing and the multiplication. Yes, they're tied up in the oath and the promise, but they give us something that we can prove, by which we can prove that God is no liar. We knew that before but we can prove it by something of substance. And so these two immutable things. You know, the last part is beautiful because it takes us, um, verse 19, and we have an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Where the forerunner has, has entered, even Jesus, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This anchor of the soul is the Lord Jesus going into heaven, with enough things to anchor us forever and ever as his by virtue of the shedding of his precious blood and our faith just in saying, thank you, Lord, for dying for me. I said the other day, and I certainly meant it, if the most high God and my God is the most high God, El Elyon, the reason I'm not worried about him as the possessor of heaven and earth if he asked me, what would you like in all this world? Every believer would have to say, nothing. You've given us everything. And when he took the precious blood, the value of the precious blood he shed into heaven, Hebrews later on will speak of this. He proved, again, this to be the substance of what was a shadow. When he took that, when he presented the power of that blood before his father in heaven. And that's the anchoring of the soul. In the ancient days, when they, when they moored a ship, they had a little boat that was called a forerunner. And the forerunner would go ahead of the larger sailing ship and find the right spot with the anchor to place it. And once it was placed that way, it was sure and steadfast. If they just dropped it overboard, well, they couldn't tell where they'd be, whether they'd be truly anchored. But the forerunner in that boat took it right to the place with all the credentials to do it. And that's what the Lord Jesus did when he anchored us into heaven, into heaven. And he said, he mixes the metaphors a little bit, saying it's the anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast, and it's within the veil. It goes beyond being a ship to being through the veil and into the holiest of all in the presence of God. You know, there was a place where they could flee in the Old Testament. If they had committed a murder that was accidental, they didn't, uh, it wasn't meaning, it wasn't a, de a deliberate murder. And that was a city of refuge. And that's something of what we have a picture of here at the end of this chapter 6, this city of refuge. First of all, in that city of refuge, you could take refuge there, but, you know, taking refuge there, you had to stay there, so you were a bit of a captive. But that's not the refuge that we have within the veil. We have refuge within the veil whereby we're not captives. We're not captives. We're rejoicing. We're overwhelmed. And, you know, they could, never, they could never leave that city of refuge, but the refuge within the veil, we don't want to leave. That's where our soul is anchored. It's anchored. 
Those that were in the Old Testament that could flee to those cities of refuge were safe until the death of the high priest. Our place in the city of refuge, the heavenly city of refuge, is safe because we have a high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us according to all that he is for us. And so I'll close with this, that he goes back to Melchizedek, and you're going to go on to Melchizedek in chapter 7 and right through to the end and the things about Melchizedek. But let us remember where our anchorage is. It's in heaven. It's in heaven. And look what the Lord Jesus Christ endured to fulfill all that Abraham or all that Aaron and his priesthood pictured for us. All that it pictured. To fulfill all of that for us. And then all that Melchizedek fulfilled it was and his priesthood that he gave and imparted to Abraham as a man. And the Lord Jesus brought all of that to fruition. You know, it's wonderful to see these types and pictures and how the Lord Jesus fulfilled them. You know, in Hebrews, you will come to a place in Hebrews where it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And I just love that verse because the writer is just chomping at the bit to tell these readers, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Remission means sending away. And on the one day of the year, when the high priest went into the holiest of holies to offer the sin offering with these two goats that were slain, he took the blood of the one goat in and sprinkled it before the Lord on the mercy seat. And then he took the other goat and they took it out and sprinkled blood on it and, and, and they sent it away by the hand of a fit man after they had declared the sins upon the head of that goat. Remission means sending away. If that blood didn't go into the holiest of all, there was no sending away of sin in the goat that ran off into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. The two things brought together in our Lord Jesus Christ, and that makes up the anchor of our soul in him. Let us remember that and go on unto maturity ourselves, day by day, never looking back, forgetting the things that are past. Let's press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we bow our hearts and praise thee for our Lord Jesus. What thanksgiving we can give to thee tonight for one who loved us in such a way and gave himself for us in such an amazing and wonderful way. He offered himself without spot unto thee, our God. Offered himself through the eternal spirit to thee. He was that great offering that's spoken of again and again in the Old Testament in shadow. But he was the reality of it because he gave himself. He gave himself to bring us unto thee. He gave himself to make of uh, to, as, to, that we might be a possession, a possession of his very own. We're thankful that he gave himself. We bless thee for gathering here tonight and being able to pray uh, now for a time. And also we thank thee for the word of God and pray it may move in our hearts, our Father, to bring us closer to thee in these last days, and they surely are last days, that we may not be forgetful of where we have come from, but rather be mindful every day more than that, of what we have come unto in the Lord Jesus Christ and continue to go on in him to his honor and praise and glory, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.